Hello and welcome to The Transformation Project, a podcast and community for women who are looking to transform into the best version of themselves no matter where they are at. A place where you can listen, learn, and laugh along with us as we dive deep into different topics to help you live a happier, healthier, and more fulfilled life. Remember, we are all learning here together, and therefore the content and opinions of the hosts and our guests should not be taken as medical advice. Please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Transformation Project. We're so excited to have you with us today. Today, we're going on a different tack, learning more about something that we know pretty much nothing about. It's part of the reason why we love this podcast, is learning so many different things along with you. Um, And so today, we're talking to Rebecca Parker. Her business is called Birth by Grace. And she is a Christian free birth doula. So welcome on, Beck. We're so excited to have you with us. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. So tell me, I mean, firstly, how did you get into being um, a doula and then specifically a free birth doula? So as a doula, if people. Yeah. So I started back when, back when I had my first, I had no idea what a doula was. Um, my mom and I were pregnant at the same time. Um, there's like a six year gap between my last two um, siblings. Wow. And it was actually amazing. Um, and she had someone recommend her a doula. Um, and so I got to meet this amazing lady, uh, Liz Lays. Um, I don't think she's practicing anymore, sadly, but she's amazing. And she ended up being my doula. Um, and I just loved the the vibe that she brought to my birth space and the comfort that I felt. Um, I remember being like in transition and she left like not like barely a distance just into the other room. And I was instantly like, no, get back here. Cause I just needed her in my space for whatever it was she brought that made me feel better and calmer. Um, And somehow, I mean, I've always loved kids, but somehow that just kind of, came into my head of like yeah that's like I love that and I want to do that and I want to give that to other women um and so that was like what started me I didn't actually become a doula until after I had my second um so that was I think two years later um and it was pretty straightforward with that I I started doing both hospital and free births um And I actually found out in the process of all this that out of my many siblings, five of them had actually, were actually free births. And I didn't know this. I knew they were like at home because I'd been at a few of them. Um, But it wasn't until after that was like, oh, that's what you call like an unassisted birth or a free birth. Um, And that made me kind of get this new understanding of this choice of birth that that I had done I hadn't even thought about it I'd just gone yeah I'm going to birth at home and I want water and I don't want a midwife like that the thought of having a midwife present just never kind of crossed my mind which I know boggles a lot of people because they're like well that's just the thing you do right Um, but it never at all crossed my mind and now you know having two more babies um, two of which were free births I yeah, I kind of go, no, I just, it's just my space. I have to have my space. I don't want to give any of that power to anybody else. Um, as long as I feel comfortable with that and my pregnancy is is good and I feel good, then I have no need to give that power and those things that are based on my intuition to someone else to know what's best for me. Um, so Can that's you kind quickly of- quickly clarify for us, what is the difference between a doula and a midwife? So a doula- the way I like to say it is a doula is everything that a midwife is without the medical training. So I hold space the same way. I offer support, um, information, um, evidence-based information. Um, I provide certain things like birth pools and comfort techniques, um, essential oils, um, all those kind of physical and non-physical. And I provide the postpartum support as well as prenatal support it's just nothing medical so I find that's probably the easiest way for anybody to understand the difference between a midwife and a doula 
um, because I have plenty of conversations with random people in public, but they're like, what, what's that? What is that? <laughs> I'm like, I am just a midwife without the medical. <laughs> yeah. And is there actually like, is there a training program for doulas? Like how do you become a doula? There is heaps of, of ones out there now. It's becoming much more popular. It's very, very popular in the States. Um, and it's gaining, gaining ground more over here, which is really good. Um, but there's, there are so many different organizations that offer, um, free, like doula training. I used, um, an international, uh, Christian based one in the States. Um, at this present point, I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> I actually didn't finish the training, um, because I had done so much research and whatnot for my own, um, birth for my first child and, and then also for my second um and then speaking with other people I'd gained a lot of knowledge that I would need anyway um and so I didn't find that I was gaining anything very new within the training that I was doing um, and sometimes people will do a training through an organization but they won't certify um and a lot of the reasons why is because depending on the organization you go through um, they might have certain stipulations for people that are certified through them. So some places, not all, but some places like the Australian Doula College doesn't allow their certified doulas to attend free births. And for a lot of us, we don't like having someone else tell us how we can run our own business. Um, that was definitely important to me. There is, you know, areas that I'm comfortable, completely comfortable with in being and some places would just not want me to do that. So can I ask a question? So I had my first and I had never heard of a doula before. And I guess kind of the opposite to what you said, I was just like, okay, well, you, you get pregnant and then you go to the, you, you go into labor and you go to the hospital. And that's kind of like all that was, all that I, I thought you did. And after I had her, I was introduced to more of the like doulas and stuff like that. And I actually asked my husband, do you want to have a home birth for our second? And he was like, absolutely not. <laughs> Funny story. We did end up having a home birth by accident. So I have a feeling <laughs> I might've had a free birth, but I was wondering, could you, cause you've said it a couple of times, what is a free birth? Mm -hmm. and, and I guess what's the, the difference between the hospital home and free birth? Yeah. Yeah. So to make it really simple, the difference between a free birth or another word is unassisted birth and a home birth is you do not have a medical person present. So even, and so yeah, I, that's like, what I had. Yeah. <laughs> not on yeah, purpose. Exactly. But... Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's awesome. <laughs> you got to experience that. Um, it sounds very exciting. <laughs> it was. And you know what? So the reason I ask this question is because I have a girlfriend who's become a doula after she had her baby for, I guess, the opposite reason. She had such a traumatic mm -hmm. um, birthing experience that she pretty much wants to make sure no women ever go through that. Yeah. Opposite of mine, both of my births in hospital and home were amazing, were so empowering. Like I, we have a podcast on it. I, I think I said empowered like a gazillion times in it because that's how I felt. I literally felt like you I could stood do there like a anything. warrior, <laughs> yeah. a, bathroom, right. a warrior, an empowered warrior. Yeah. So, so with a home birth, there's still a medical person there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So home birth still has a midwife and usually you have two midwives. Um, cause they always, especially yeah. in Australia, they have to work with two. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, really simply that's the difference um there is there's also another form where it's an unassisted pregnancy and unassisted birth where um and I think there's a little bit of variation to this I pretty much did this with my last um and it's just where in the pregnancy it's similar to with the birth you're taking responsibility you're taking control of your care and you don't necessarily have a GP or a midwife that you see um and you kind of choose what medical care you need. Um, so like I had regular bloods that I got done early on. Um, I never felt the need for a ultrasound with my third. So I had no ultrasounds. It was purely intuition based on what the needs were of my body. And I just followed them. So I didn't have like a care provider. Um, and that is more called like a unassisted pregnancy. So those are 
some like you know even further away from the system and anything medical again Mm -hmm. I really like that so with my second I did I think I did the dating scan and then I didn't do the 12 week one or whatever is next Mm -hmm. and I remember getting everyone that I spoke to after was like why didn't you do it and I was like I just didn't I didn't feel the need to do it like I'm I'm healthy like my first pregnancy was good this one has been going fine like and yeah, I just remember my GP was like, I also switched GPs half pregnancy. So, and both of them were like, why didn't you do the 12 week scan? I did go to find out the sex at the 20 week scan. And I remember the, the ultrasound technician was like, I don't seem to have your 12 week scan here. And I was like, oh, I didn't do it. He was like, why? And I was like, I don't know. I just, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it's crazy because it wasn't that long ago that we didn't have scans at all. Yeah. And it's like, it's a privilege to have this insight into our bellies. Yeah. Um, like my grandparents are like, oh, you guys are just, you know, special. <laughs> Even my mom was like, I didn't have three scans. Hmm. Why, why are you having three scans? She's like, yeah. that's great. Send me photos. Like she's in Canada. So she was, you know, she wanted to be a part of it somehow. And the photos obviously did that, but yeah, just, yeah. Very different. Yeah. Yeah. So a hospital doula is still someone that you would like, you would still connect with someone and say, I want a hospital birth, but I want you to come with me. Um, yeah. So I technically, I mean, I do have one hospital client at the moment, but I don't technically attend hospitals anymore. Um, and there's a few reasons, um, it's only like in the last year, maybe not even a full year that I chose that. So I was doing all types of births from when I started four years ago. And then, um, I just had so many different experiences, both good and bad in the hospital. Um, and I realized it was taking a toll on me and, you know, a lot of people talk about the toll that, you know, different experiences traumatic to varying degrees have on the mothers who birth in the system. But there's another side for the women that are in the hospital with the mothers, the support people. I don't think, I don't, I guess in my circles, I haven't found it to be talked about much of the kind of trauma that can be put on us as birth workers and the, you know, how that just affects us over time. And I mean, I've never liked the system. I didn't grow up with that being a normal thing. I grew up very, very out of the system, very alternative. Um, and you know, obviously that shows with the fact that I had my first baby as a free birth in water at home. But I, yeah, I even realized that even more so recently that I was feeling really drained because of these experiences that I was sharing with other mums that I was supporting in hospital. Mm-hmm. And I just realized that it, I couldn't give all that I wanted to give in that setting. I couldn't give the support that I wanted to give in that setting because one, the mums weren't necessarily looking for all of that full on intuitive, um, really learning to trust themselves and not listening to the doctors. And two, the hospital people, they don't let you. And I don't like that fight. It's really difficult to kind of be in that space and and feel all the things. Yeah. Um, And I'm very sensitive to everyone's emotions. And I just had just a really big pullback to just focusing on on women at home. Um, You know, I do do mainly free births. I will attend home births. I just have never been asked to attend a home birth. It's always been either hospital or or free births. And um, I just made the decision that it was better for myself so that I could give all that I could um, and not have to limit anything and not drain on myself to be able to support mums at home. I actually had, with my first daughter um, in South Africa, I had a doula in the hospital. And for me, um, that was just because, A, I was terrified. I'd gone to uh, sort of prenatal classes and they showed this like, horrendously graphic video of a woman having a cesarean and whatever. And I was so terrified that I was going to have a cesarean. Like it was keeping me up at night. I was terrified. And it was simply because I had no experience of cesareans. I just seen this video that they'd show me at the prenatal class that like had burned its way into my brain. 
Um, and so for me, it was almost that I felt that I needed a doula with me to speak for me, even though my husband was there, but I needed her there as like a backup support to speak for me if I could not, because I wanted like nothing to do with a cesarean if I could. Um, and so that was my experience of a doula was like this extra kind of support person with me. But I do remember her saying at the time that there may well always be a battle between her and the hospital staff. Yes, no, that is that is true. I have had those experiences, not too intense, thankfully, but I have had them. It's a hard kind of balance to find with clients um, because you never know what the hospital is going to be like. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely would always say to them, you know, we're very big on um, the plan, you know, the goals, the play, things they're okay with, looking at the alternatives so they knew how to make the decisions if other things came up. And that that helped me as well because if we were very clear on what mum's plan was and where she wanted to go in, in, in alternate decisions, what she was comfortable with, then that helped me to speak up because then they weren't seeing me as this extra person who was just talking. It's me going, hey, let's refer back to the plan here. Mum said yes to this. She said no to this. Can we please, you know, not do this or can we please do more of this? Um, so that was very helpful for myself as a doula in a hospital setting to, to be able to speak up because, yeah, it is very, very hard to do that. I think when you're in the middle of labor, you're in such a vulnerable position mm -hmm. like in so many different ways in your mental space but I'm even thinking like half the time you're naked or you know and if you don't have that confidence to speak yeah having a doula would be so yeah. so important I think even for me I mean everyone knew my plan but I didn't know the midwife that was going to deliver my baby when I went to the hospital like it was whoever was on shift and I think yeah. while we were there I think I had three midwives and I remember when I went to start pushing the last midwife was like okay it's cut like we gotta we gotta go and I mean she was joking but she was like I finish at seven so like this needs, <laughs> this needs to be done in an hour and a half and we did have a joke and she's like I'm just kidding I'm totally not gonna leave you doesn't matter but it was like I, I was very confident but if something had come up and it didn't go so well I don't think my husband would have been I don't want to say pushy but I don't, I think he just would have fought, wanted to follow the doctors and yeah. he just would have been like, Jess, just stop arguing. Cause yeah. I remember even they checked me and I was only at like five centimeters and then my water broke and I was like, I need to push. And the girl, midwife was like, no, you do not <laughs> don't push yet. And it went on for quite a while. And I was like, I need, I'm pushing. I can't stop. I like, and Ben was just like, no, she said, don't push Jess, don't push. And I'm like, I'm pushing. <laughs> And I, and she checked me and I was actually fully dilated and, and ready. She was just so surprised how fast it had yeah. gone. But, but that was it. If I had just, I guess, been quiet and been like, well, she told me to stop pushing. I'm just yeah. going to sit here and take this pain. Like it would have yeah. been so good having that, that mm -hmm. other person there on your side. I yeah. Really like that. Yes. It's, um, and I think this, this is similar with, with home and free births, um, because, the dads still are like, I mean, I've even got one client currently and <clears throat> the dad is so unsure. And, but thankfully he loves reading things and he wants to know all the stuff. So I'm like, great, I will send you a whole document of research articles and evidence-based information so you can be fully informed and fully aware. Um, and I find it's really helpful to work with dads as much as I possibly can if they will let me. Um, so that they can get that same understanding of where mum wants to be so that they can be there and know that it's not about what other people say. It's about what mum says and what she is intuitively saying um, and being aware of her plan. Like if they can know what her plan is and know what she's comfortable with and not comfortable with, and then at the end of the day, go, all right, what she says goes and and be strong in that like I know sometimes it can be really daunting to think oh gosh I have to get to stand up and and speak and like hold my ground um but I find that really helps empower dads to to have the information and then to have someone continually say just trust mom trust mom trust mom like trust what she says she knows her body she's doing especially for a free birth she's doing this because she's choosing to take control of the whole thing she's choosing to take 
responsibility to fully listen to her body an intuition level that you know we don't do even with a home birth with a midwife because you're still giving some of that power over to the midwife um, to know what's best or not best um, and so with dads they can have that person that known doula through the pregnancy helps them to kind of build up that confidence and and knowledge to to yeah, not not do the whole I guess we'll just trust the doctors but to do the whole hey my wife you know partner knows what they're doing she's the one giving birth um and we're going to trust her yeah I think especially you, for first time dads yeah they would be scared and they'd yeah. be like so I imagine if you have a first time dad and and mum says I want to have a free birth. This guy's thinking, holy cow, man, I'm delivering my baby on the floor. Like it's on that me. Was, I'm going to be catching this baby. Of. Let's not, let's go to the, you know, yeah. so I can imagine for a lot of dads, there would definitely be a heightened sense of sort of maybe responsibility um, and a bit of a fear factor that pl- plays a role there as well that you as a doula would need to work with them on. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're, they're terrified. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they don't know, right? They, they haven't carried no a baby for nine months. They don't. They don't no. know how anything's supposed to feel like. No, and 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 yeah, they kind of just they sit there and they're like, "What am I supposed to do?" Mm-hmm. Even dads that are like, "Okay, she wants to do this, or I'll go along with her." They'll still be like, "I have no idea what I'm supposed to do." I guess I'll just sit in the back corner, and I'm like, yeah. "No, come in, and we'll show you what, yeah. what you can do." Um, and yeah, the exact that responsibility, and and with this other dad, like they've had three other kids. Um, and it's still very medical and very much, oh my gosh, I don't want to like jump. He, you know, he's scared of jumping in um, when he's not needing to, just because it's like, he sees something and he's like, oh, maybe I should do this, you know? Um, and I find um, probably the first thing I do with dads that are like concerned or worried or, or anything, I, I have this, this document um, and it's all like the majority of, things that would go differently um ranging from like you know um a nuchal cord to a postpartum hemorrhage and I show them like hey we have step-by-step processes that we do in these situations these is this is how we handle it this is how we approach it this is when we call you know for extra assistance um and this is when we don't need to um and you know all the statistics for those things and how rare or not rare they are as well and that's that's probably the first thing I show them and when they see that they're like oh okay (laughs) that makes me feel better you know what you're doing like yes I know what I'm doing (laughs) you're not just winging it yeah (laughs) yeah I just think back to like the billions of years that women have been delivering their babies and a lot of them just used to go and squat next to a tree and deliver their own baby like yeah that and we had villages of support yeah we had women and it it was just it was what we do and it still mind boggles me that people like oh my gosh I can't believe you'd endanger your child and birth at home it's like well you know we survived this long (laughs) I've been thrived this long (laughs) yeah exactly what do you say though I don't think this is just my circle but I feel like I hear more and more traumatic birth stories now I mean I not that I spoke about them when I was younger but like I feel like I hear more and I feel like a lot of my friends are like no I hear more traumatic birth stories than I hear positive birth stories what's your take on that I think there's a few reasons for that um the I don't know if the trauma or obstetric violence has necessarily worsened I'm not 100% sure on that but the support networks I feel I like have widened and especially with the recent happenings and you know the past two years of things in the world pushing women out of the system um it's made women more uh, confident to talk and whereas in the past women weren't you know they didn't feel confident to share something that was so deeply traumatic for them and now we're being told we need to speak about this and people are being told there is a really high obstetric violence statistics um and they go oh I'm part of that I didn't realize that actually happened to me I didn't realize that I was 
you know, treated so horribly um, during my birth because we're told to, well, we're, you know, if, if, if we have a cascade of interventions, we're told, oh, well, the doctor saved you instead yeah. of the fact that they, they had to caused that and really, you know, they caused this, this situation. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's a mix of like women realizing that they're part of this statistic and acknowledging their birth stories and then feeling confident to share that. I haven't heard more, but I think I've heard more balanced. Both Just more people sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so obviously there's got, like with anything, right, there's pros and cons to having your birth in a hospital. There's pros and cons to having your birth at home. And there's kind of pros and cons to, to free birthing. Um, when would you as a mom be kind of comfortable and happy and as a doula comfortable and happy with somebody proceeding with a free birth and when would you go hang on that's a red flag we need to consider going a different way yeah so when I meet with a mom who wants to free birth I instantly want to know why and I look for her taking responsibility if at all she's like oh well you'll do this right and you'll do that and you'll take care of that that's a red flag to me that is really a big one something that I can probably help educate her on and help kind of direct her in the right way to go um but you never want someone to have a free birth and expect other people to still take up those roles that a medical person would um often that's women who are coming out of traumatic events and past experiences and going I don't want to have anything to do with that so I'm going to do this the extreme and I have nothing wrong with women who want to do that but they've you've got to have the right mindset you've got to understand that this is a choice that takes a lot of responsibility takes a lot of of learning about yourself and your intuition because if you don't have that then you're not going to know when you need to do something if something's off you're not going to know because you're not listening to your body so I need mums to be very aware of that and that responsibility that they're taking on that I don't do anything medical um, within a relationship there is things that we agree on um, but as a rule that has to be very clear and if they don't understand that then they don't understand what a free birth is um, Women, I'm, majority of births, I'm happy, for, you know, would attend as a free birth. Like I supported a mum who had twins. I don't know if you've um, seen her story going around. Um, Alison, uh, she had twins, uh, free births at home at 34 weeks. We thought she was 35 weeks, but. <laughs> uh, and that went amazingly. And she is like the prime example of a mum to free birth because she fully listened to her body fully. She didn't have any scans. She didn't know for home central she was having twins. Um, and she completely understood the responsibility of the decision that she was making that, you know, I could, I could give information. I could provide evidence and support and my opinion um, but that ultimately she had to be the one that made decisions and that she held that weight of that responsibility on herself. Obviously, there's clear situations where you wouldn't, like if you late in pregnancy had a clear diagnosed placenta previa, you have really no choice in that situation. Yeah. If there was uncontrolled diabetes. Cholestasis. Yes. So cholestasis is an instance that you, you don't necessarily have to rule it out, but depending on, you'd want to monitor it because sometimes it can be reversed, but that's often one that's a bit more touchy and you need to be a bit more careful. So you might be in the hospital for that. Unless there's like a very clear medical issue that you absolutely cannot birth without medical people present, birth at home. What if baby was breech? Yeah. I've you can still birth at home. Yeah, I've supported breech. I supported a kneeling breech birth actually, which is extremely rare. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Cause I feel like that's always what you hear. That's at least every time I went to the doctors or saw the midwife, they were like, always checking which way baby mm -hmm. is. And, and I know there's things you can do to make sure baby flips and baby can even flip during yeah. labor, but I don't want to say they make you scared about that, but I kind of, it's <laughs> kind a lack of, of training. Honestly, <laughs> they've, they've stopped teaching that 
how you you know for medical people at least they've stopped teaching how to handle those situations and how to trust that situation well, how to handle that situation I think now it's just a c-section well yeah exactly because like, doc majority of doctors aren't trained in breech births yeah so they don't know so they're instantly like oh we can't do this yeah. um there is thankfully a few people that are you know going around the world um Rixa Fries she's she travels and teaches breech training um and so like there is people out there thankfully uh but breech is another variation of normal it's it's just another way the baby can be born um a lot of times I like I say to mums it's another part of trusting the body is to trust the baby and to trust that you know we can do certain exercises and things to encourage baby to be head down um but at the end of the day and I had to do this for my own I haven't had a breach but with the whole where is baby sitting you know, I encourage mums to have chiropractic care. I encourage them to be active, to do different gentle maneuvers, to encourage baby to be in a good position. And then at the end of the day, go, you know what? I got to trust them to know how to be born. They know how to do it. Like it's, it's literally created in their being to know how to be born. Um, and, and if they feel that being breech is the best way and safest way for them to be born, then that's how how it's best and sometimes I even see with mums who have c-sections because they had a breech baby and the way the baby comes out and how the cord is like well that's why <laughs> and it's like there always there's always something that explains why they're in that position mm. um and and it's because you know they're like well I'm in this is why the cord's in this position or the placenta's in this position so it was there were the most room was for them to be sitting like that. Yeah, um, yeah. With my third, um, I can, I always felt in the last stages of my pregnancy that he was sitting like off to the side of like my pelvis. And I'm like, this is just not cool. And I got in my head a bit and I did a little, like maybe half a week or a week of, of like regular movements and maneuvers to encourage him to get into a good position. And when I do them, he'd sit perfectly. And then within like an hour, he was back where he wanted to be. And after doing that, like, you know, that week, I had to just be like, you know what? He's doing whatever he wants to do and I can't make him go where I think he should be. So I've just got to trust that when labor comes, he will move into where he needs to be. And he did exactly that um, for the first like two hours I had a five hour labor with him for the first like two hours of that it was him moving and being mm -hmm. where he needed to be and it was an interesting sensation because it's like my contractions never really ended because the in-between was him still moving and it felt like a contraction um and and that was I would say that was my empowering birth that was amazing experience it was so intense but not painful at all um, and it was, yeah, it was trusting that he would move into the correct position. And he did exactly that. I love it. Oh my goodness. I think too, because a lot of women in that hospital situation, you're kind of, um, we certainly for my first daughter, ultimately you were on the bed and you were on your back. It was like back. I mean, so my first, my daughter is 21 now. So back then, like there's no birthing ball in the room, like there's a bed and you're lying on the bed. And that's the end of that. Like there's no, whereas when I had Savannah, it, we were still in hospital. Um, I was an older mom. Um, and, but there was a birthing ball and we could have had a, um, a like a water birth in the hospital. Like, so, but before then that those things weren't in, even available. It's almost like we went from weirdly, like what you call, like, or what we would call now alternative, which is actually, normal <laughs> what we were designed to do yeah. yeah to like the far opposite of like women need to be lying on their back with their legs in the air which is like the completely wrong position to yeah. be in to yeah. have a baby and now we're sort of gradually moving back towards actually what is more natural for a woman and I'm wondering if that's because you know back then when I was having my child most of the gynecologists and most of the people talking about birthing were men. Mm. 
in the hospitals. The doctors were men back then. Yeah. So they're deciding for us how we should be lying in the hospital. And as we're gradually kind of moving back towards that empowerment, not just within ourselves, but also within um, the women who are, or who are assisting us, the women who are guiding us, the women even within the hospital system who are encouraging these other things, we're kind of moving back towards what is actually better for women. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to more convenient, perhaps for the doctor. Like our joke was, our doctor was back then was trying to push us for a cesarean. And his joke was because he had like, you know, a 10 a.m. tea time for golf. Like that yeah. was like, right. So I think we're kind of gradually getting back to not what's best for you, but what's best for mum. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of crazy to think about how that all happened yeah. and how it so quickly moved from majority at home to majority in hospital mm -hmm. um and it, it, this it's mind-boggling <laughs> how that happened because we're just like oh okay you tell me it's safer in hospital guess i'll go to hospital and it just happened yeah and now we're you know more and more women are understanding um and being educated re-educated because for you know two three generations we've had hospital births as a norm and now we've got you know what two at least two generations now that are kind of being re-educated and understanding of of what birth really is and that birth isn't some crazy scene in a movie that makes it look horrifying and ridiculous um <laughs> with babies that do not like not look like newborn babies <laughs> yeah <laughs> so crazy so when I first thought a doula when I first kind of heard of it I'm thinking okay the only people that get a doula is if maybe if they don't have a partner or a mom or someone to be some a support person to be there with them or if you're going to do a home birth that's kind of the, when I first heard of it I was like that's the only reason you get a doula I now know that that's very incorrect but what what would you say for a woman who's thinking about it what are like why would she why would she choose a doula? Who should she choose? What should she look for? That kind of stuff. Yeah. So I would first, I guess, encourage her to look at the birth environment that she wants. Um, because there's different reasons. If she was most comfortable in a hospital setting, then there's certain doulas that would best fit that. And if she was most comfortable in a, at home, whether with midwife or not, um, then other doulas would best fit that because every doula is different. Every doula works differently. Mm -hmm. um, so if she found, you know, that she felt most comfortable in a hospital setting, um, because some of them just do, and that's what I always say. I'm like, you know, you will birth safest where you feel most comfortable. And sometimes that's hospital. So in a hospital setting, the reason that you would want a doula is because of the hospital and because of their policies and procedures that they do. And having a known doula, just like if you had a known midwife, having a known doula has been proven to reduce um, rate of interventions. Um, you have a higher chance of having a positive birth experience. You um, reduce the rate of any pain medication you don't often need pain medication because of what the doula brings in terms of educating about positioning movement breathing uh setting up the environment so that it invokes all the endorphins and all all the hormones that we need in labor um and having someone as as that second spokesperson who knows what she wants and can encourage her and support her and help hold her up in what she wants because as you mentioned earlier we're very vulnerable when we're in labor and very agreeable to things we wouldn't usually be agreeable to even you know prior when we're pregnant and talking about what our birth plan is um and so it's it's important to have that door in that setting so they can help you stick to what you want and not be pushed and pulled either way the hospital might want understanding that the hospital policy might say they want you to have intermittent or continuous monitoring, but you don't have to have that. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to have that. I'm here to remind you that you don't have to have that. Um, for instances where there's a situation happening 
and they might be concerned about Bub's heart rate dropped once or twice. And then they leave the room, I'm there and I can say, hey, I was watching the monitor and I just wanted to let you know in case you weren't aware, it only dropped a couple of times and it's best to move around and change position rather than get more monitoring or move on to an intervention and do that first because that's what the hospitals won't tell you. Even with the best of midwives, I've only had a couple that have understood that when um, positioning with baby and heart monitoring and things come up as concerns, the first point of call is to move, change mm -hmm. position, do some breathing, recenter not to start more monitoring or look at more intervention. So it's reminding of, of the natural that her body could do, um, reminding her of her body's ability um, because the hospital doesn't do that. The hospital doesn't provide that. Um, there's some lovely midwives, but they don't have time. And with shift changes, you don't, unfortunately don't get that relationship with yeah. these women and you might have an amazing midwife and then shift change happens and you get a horrible one that can completely wreck everything that you've just set in place. Yeah. Um, so having someone set there who is with you the whole time keeps things stable um, and keeps a positive, encouraging environment. Um, and then for if she was birthing at home, whether with a midwife or not, um, that is situation is I'm there to be a experienced birth attendant, to be someone who has knowledge and um, education, who's aware of different things, because I fully trust a mum to know what she needs. Um, but sometimes, especially in terms of like bleeding or if she raises concerns, I have the understanding and knowledge and experience to kind of know what she's saying and revert that back to her with a bit of extra information to help her know what's best. So not making the decision for her, but mirroring it with some educated information. And so it allows me to kind of give that insight and be that person that's in the room that doesn't necessarily always have to say something, but I'm there as a flower on the wall. And she knows that there's this extra person there that she can talk to who has that knowledge and experience to help her work through what she needs to work through. Yep. Um, and also, you know, I bring certain things to the birth space that she might not have, particularly like a birth pool or massage equipment, and also for the dad <laughs> at home. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> they need support too. <laughs> sometimes it's the dads that are like, I need you to have someone else there if you're going to birth at home. Fair enough. I think we definitely would have needed someone if we had purposely birthed at home. Yeah. Um, Ben, Ben, I think would have needed somebody to just exa exactly what you just said, just to, just to reassure, to say, this is normal or yeah. like, it's okay. Yeah. And that's something that actually Ben things. wasn't even in the, I mean, he was next to you, right. But you literally like caught your own child. Well, Ben technically caught him. Ben, oh, that's right. That's right. Ben was on the phone with the paramedic. Ben was on the phone. And I was like, he's coming. He, and Ben is like relaying this to the paramedic. And I'm like, nope, he's here. He's here. <laughs> and Ben like looks down and then was like, oh, and then put his hand there. And then, yeah. Yeah, no, that was actually Ben has played some baseball in his time. So yeah. his catching skills are impeccable. Are yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Cool. Yeah. Oh, I that love was, it. We've that was definitely so something good. that I, that I probably should yeah, add and with the whole dad stuff and that side of things is is having someone there who knows if especially if the mum's like busy in her space if he's like I don't know is this okay is this normal having the doula there to be like yeah, yeah it's okay it she's yeah. okay this is all normal birth stuff yeah because for me like I didn't want to really speak to anybody mm. I was breathing I was like swaying I was doing my own thing yeah I didn't want to yeah, I wasn't talking to anybody. So for sure he would have needed some form of like, she's okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 And sometimes I know those weird norm noises she's making. Yeah. Or normal. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beck, if somebody needed to reach you, if they want to know more about free births or they want to contact you, how does someone go about doing that? I have Instagram, Facebook, and my website, but it's birthedbygrace.com. Um, and that's the same on Instagram, same on Facebook. 
my email address is birthedbygrace at outlook.com. Um, so anybody can reach me on any of these platforms for any questions or if they're wanting um, a doula for their birth. I'm in the Brisbane Ipswich area as well. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today, Beck. I've learned heaps today. Mm. You're very welcome. Thanks I for feel coming. like if uh, if Jess is looking at another baby, we'd... Uh... I can see she's not. Like, she's but she's not. <laughs> okay, don't put that out there. No, don't here. put that out there. <laughs> ben said it the other day. He's like, yeah, maybe if we have a third. And I was like, whoa, Shop this is close. <laughs> this is not been talking about. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just putting that up. We're making sure clearly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us on another episode today. We were so happy to share it with you wherever you are in the world. We hope you are having an absolutely incredible day and we will see you next time on The Transformation Project. Thank you for listening in to this episode of The Transformation Project. The Transformation Project is not just a podcast. We're also a community. We're a collective of like-minded people all around the world seeking to live their best life and raise each other up. We're looking to support you, set goals, get healthier, connect with yourself and others at a deeper level, and better understand yourself and the world around you. We're always looking to link arms with like-minded people wanting to create more out of life. You can connect with us via our website, which is www.thetransformationproject.net.au. Email us at support at thetransformationproject.net.au or simply listen in to one of our podcast episodes, which can be found on all podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can even watch some of our episodes on our YouTube channel, simply called The Transformation Project. Please like and subscribe to make sure you hear all the incredible shows and guests we have lined up. If you have any feedback or any comment, we would love to hear those, as well as any ideas or guests that you think we should be interviewing in future. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Transformation Project.